Welcome to The Robin Graham Show, the podcast for purpose-driven women who want to achieve sustainable success without having to be on social media. Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of The Robin Graham Show. I am here today with Haley Cooper, a very special guest. She has a heart for fundraising and nonprofits, and that is her business. So when we talk about looking at our values, visions, and passions. She's a perfect example of that because she's following her values. She's she's following her passions and she has big visions to help and support nonprofits to create that ripple effect of good in the world, as we always say. Mm -hmm. So I am super excited to have this conversation. So any of you who are interested in starting a ministry, starting a nonprofit, really growing something from maybe the ground up, or maybe you already have a nonprofit and you're struggling a little bit. We're going to dive into not only fundraising strategies, but how you can get better board involvement, that emotional connection for their stepping forward to help raise funds as well. Haley Cooper, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Thank you so much, Robin. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited to see you. I interviewed on your show, oh my gosh, it's been probably a year now or close to it. So yeah. it's been a while since we've talked in person on Zoom. Um, we've just been connected on LinkedIn. So I'm really happy to see you live again. So it's special, special to me. Special to me as well. I always love seeing your bright smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yours too. Okay. So let's dive straight in. Tell the listeners a little bit about you and how did you get to this point in your journey? Like you started at a very young age being passionate about nonprofits. So tell us your story. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of funny. So I grew up in a very philanthropic family here in Orange County and grew up going to nonprofit events, specifically one that's now called the Wooden Floor, but it was called St. Joseph Ballet. My grandparents were like instrumental in um, helping with that organization along with some other ones. And you know, I would go and I would like experience the events, but I didn't know what a nonprofit was. Like I would serve at soup kitchens on Thanksgiving, things like that. And it wasn't until I was 24 and went on my first missions trip to Malawi, Africa, that I realized, oh, there's an opportunity to serve here. Like you can make a career out of a nonprofit. And I went there in August of 2011. And about six months after that trip, um, the leader of that trip invited me into his office and said, Haley, do you want to go make peanut butter in Malawi for a year? And I said, sure, let's do it. He's like, go home and pray on it. I was like, nope, I'm going to, I'm going to do this with you. So that was in March of 2012. And in March, I, I, and I started making peanut butter in my parents' kitchen and did the fast track of learning what a nonprofit was. I was like, what's a 501c3? Like, what are bylaws? What are articles of incorporations? Like, you actually have to hire people like compensation. And, you know, we don't have to get into that because it, there's a lot of nuances, especially um, in a foreign country. But I moved to Malawi in August of 2012 at age 24 and started a peanut butter factory from scratch. And literally we got there. We were promised a factory. It was rubble. We worked with the original founder of the product to um get a license to utilize their formula. And essentially, I mean, it's called a ready to use therapeutic food. And it's essentially a fortified peanut butter taste that tastes like the inside of a Reese's. Um, And in one little packet has 500 calories of protein, of fiber, of all the nutrients that a child experiencing malnourishment would need to grow healthy. And so we Hire, that's kind of how I got into nonprofits, which is being thrown into it, like literally packed my bags and flew across the world um, and lived there for two and a half years and then traveled back and forth for another two and a half. And um, my last trip there, and then I'll move on to the rest of my career to today, um, is I went to Copenhagen to a UNICEF conference to get our product, one, our name in front of them. Um, and then also learn about the, their compliance standards to be able to sell the product for widespread distribution. So they audited our factory and our product, and we had to meet certain standards, which they do now, um, 13 years later. But uh, at the time, we had we still had a lot of work to do to get our small factory equipped to be sold. Um, so I moved back and I started working 
I, I joined AFP because I was the Association of Fundraising Professionals. And I was like, OK, well, we started with five people, but we need to fundraise a little bit more. And I was like, like, what fundraise? Like, I know about like raising money, like raising money from like a lemonade stand. But like, what does that actually look like? Right. And so I did their mentorship program and I had a wonderful mentor, Alan Pearson from Blue Letter Bible. Um, at the time. And he taught me about individual giving and major gifts. And he taught me about all of it. And I built my first fundraising strategy for PB&J. And it, honestly, I still use the tactics to today. Like I reference them in my Google Drive of what he taught me 12 years ago. Um, and I just learned that that was an avenue that I wanted to go down. And again, I, I mean, I studied kinesiology in college. So I went from wanting to be a registered dietitian to now being a fundraiser, which was like a huge mindset shift where I did not know that was the path I was going to go down. Anyways, um, I ended up getting my CFRE in 2018, and I've worked in a variety of settings, both very small grassroots where I am a party of one first fundraiser organization has been around for 30 years, never fundraised, and I'm the one that comes in. Maybe they've done events here and there. They've had some gifts, but not transformational giving or really a solid either individual strategy or grant strategy. So helped build that up. Um, I've also worked in, you know, more corporate environments where um, you have your job and you kind of stick to it. Um, so I've worked in a right of array of organizations and I've also sat on um, several board of directors as well. Um, so I've experienced both reporting to a board and sitting, and that board experience. And today, um, in 2022, I decided to step back from a full-time role as a director of development to raise three babies. I have three kids under five. Um, and I was not ready to let go of fundraising. And through my experience and just talking with my friends, this vision came to me when I was on maternity leave to start the Savvy Fundraiser. And it was really focusing on the idea of um, fundraising strategy, but incorporating this piece that I'm trained in called emotional connection leadership. So I know we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, and I will wrap up my history of um, entering nonprofits because it's it could probably be like three episodes. <laughs> okay. It, well, and it just may be. We'll see how long our conversation goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Haley, you said so much there. And I think your journey has been remarkable and it really demonstrates that you know what you're talking about. So um, I would love to dive into PB&J, but for the sake of this episode, let's just talk about some of the strategies that you still use today that you learned all those years ago for raising. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about... Um, off camera. And this is kind of where I want to focus the talk is, especially when you're a new nonprofit or, you know, like the ones I've been in where they've been around for a long time and they've done some fundraising, but they don't have an effective strategy. We tend to find ourselves getting busy. Um, and, you know, when I was a new fundraiser, I was like, oh, this sounds like a great idea. Like this nonprofit's doing that. Like, let's go do that. Like, let's, let's host this event. Let's go, you know, send that appeal. Um, without really understanding who my donors were. Um, and so sometimes those events or those appeals would fall flat because I didn't know who I was talking to. And I wasn't being strategic about what I was asking for, how I was telling the story, what I was including in the messaging. And so that's kind of the foundation of what I kind of focus on in the fundraising strategy, and you can obviously ask me more questions, is, you know, getting so a solid strategy will take that busyness out of it, and it'll help you focus and become more efficient. Because like we talked about off camera, like we can be doing all of the things, but at the end of the night at 10 p.m., when we finally rest our heads on our pillow and all the thoughts come to us and we're like, what did we actually do today? Like, how did we actually raise funds? Where did we move the mission forward? I'm exhausted and I have to do this all over again tomorrow. And I'm so passionate about this mission. So I'm going to wake up and do it. But that doesn't lead to efficiency and it leads to that exhaustion, right? And that's where a solid fundraising strategy, and we'll talk about the emotional connection piece, really helps revitalize your energy towards your mission 
through a solid strategy plan, fundraising plan. So you're focusing on the right things and becoming more efficient on the way that you're able to deliver your mission. So let's look first. I want to talk about um, some of these strategies to raise money. But before we do, how do you recognize who your ideal donors are? It's easy for us to identify who our soulmate clients are, right? They're the people that you know we're going to feel fulfilled working with, and they're going to get extreme results by working with us. So, or we're going to solve a provide a solution to their biggest problem and really help them meet their needs, wants, and desires. What does it look like when we're talking about knowing who our donors are? Yeah, that's a great question, and I feel like it's kind of a similar process. Like I I've been through it in the business where you're like ideal customer, right? Like you have that persona of your ideal customer. So, uh, a colleague of mine, Chris Rolke, he taught me about this concept of ideal donor avatar. Mm -hmm. And so you want to, again, develop this persona of the ideal person that you want. So this can be based on history of who, if you have some sort of donor database, even an Excel spreadsheet, whatever it is, um, you can start there and, you know, build it off of their affinity to give, their capacity to give, their demographics, their socioeconomic status, um, what, you know, where are their top three charities, um, because you want to be one of the top three, but where do they give, um, and, you know, really building out those demographics of your current donors. And then based on that, you can say, who do we want more of? Who do we want to attract? And identify some of those key parameters. And age can be one as well. I know a lot of nonprofits are now focusing on, you know, the younger generations. Um, but there's a way, and then, you know, there's a way that you can target, for lack of a better term, those different demographics based on who you want more of in your donor database. And so, um, it's really coming down to, yeah, again, identifying that ideal donor avatar through demographics, through their um, giving history, um, their networks, and then identifying out of that, who do you want more of um, and building out that persona so that you can begin to craft your messaging to talk to that ideal person. So, okay. So when you're doing that exercise, so you mentioned like, who are their top three organizations that they donate to. Do you ask the people specifically? Because if you have a database, like how do you search? How do you search that? How do you know that information? Is it through survey or polls? Um, you could do a survey. I would also just ask, to be honest, um, because I mean, your goal in the conversations are to, like I said, you want to be in the top, ideally in the top three charities, because that's where most people give the most money. Maybe they'll give a little bit here and there, but generally um, the top three. So I would ask them and then I would have that candid conversation about what is it about your organization that they would then prioritize to be in that top three. Um, and I think it's just a candid conversation of asking, you know, what, where do your passions and interests lie um, and starting that conversation. And I think it'll lead to that. You can also do um a donor wealth screen. And I think there's a few databases that have them included. Otherwise you can um, do them separately, but I, yeah, I would, but they can get to be expensive and those give you more a deep dive into people's assets and, you know, where they give. Um, but I would, based on the re relational side of things, which I always prioritize is just simply asking the question or like starting that conversation and asking the question and being candid about how your organization can be better position itself. Mm, I like that. Okay. So what are some of the events or strategies that you've used in the past that have been really successful in terms of fundraising? Yeah. So you said events. <laughs> I, I'm not anti-events, but I think there is a time and a place for them. But I, there's three areas that I really focus on. One is individual giving. Um, so again, it's looking, I think the busyness comes also from like the shiny object syndrome where we're like, oh, we need to go get new donors. Um, I have this conversation all the time of we need to raise a million dollars in 12 months from new donors. And when I 
kind of unpack it a little bit. It's like, well, we don't have, our current donors aren't giving. So now we have to go find new money. And I think there's a wrong mindset there that if you do have a database, you do have people who have shown up, who have said yes, or if you have volunteers or you have a board or you've had an event, like those people have shown up, they have said yes, you start there. Because if you want to get new money, you can get new money from the people that have already said yes. They already mm -hmm. know about your organization. And I'm not here to say it. I'm not against like prospecting and things. I think there is a time and place, but also that can come naturally when you start to have those conversations with your current donors and that transformational giving happens. And then they're able to go out to their friends and tell them about it. They become your ambassadors. And I think that also happens on the board as well. Um, and so really focusing on the individual giving strategy. So, I mean, it's really building under, again, understanding who's in your donor database and segmenting out different, um, appeals or in your email database, like don't just send out emails to a 10,000 person. I mean, maybe you don't have 10,000, but you know, a 10,000 person email list. If you don't know who's, who's there, who are you talking to? So it's really important to understand who you're talking to. It's really under, important to have a solid donor database. Yes. I know if you're small, I've had an Excel spreadsheet, but make sure that it is functional and there are people who understand who your donors are so that you can then have those conversations with your major donors. So I identify, you know, the organization I'm thinking of, they had like 2000 people in their donor database and I identified the top 200 and started there to work with them. Um, and I would chart out a goal for them to based on their history and conversations I had, and I knew their capacity to give was bigger than what they were giving. And I knew that they wanted to realize their generosity in a meaningful way. I set a goal for them for the year. And then I tracked different, I set a communication calendar. So I would regularly communicate with them. And it wasn't always asking them for money because I think a lot of people scare away from that in fundraising. They're like, oh, well, and I mean, I've even had that phone call where I call and I'm like, I'm the director of development. And they're like, I already gave you money. And I'm like, oh, I'm just calling to say thank you, right? Like there are different touch points that you can have. And I would keep track of it. I would make sure that your team knows about it. And then any meaningful touch point, I would record it so that if you go into your Excel spreadsheet or you go into um, your donor database, anyone can go in there and know the relationship status. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's just tr like, under just to wrap it up, understanding who your donors are, setting those goals, creating a communication calendar, um, and then tracking those meaningful gifts in your donor database. That's it. So those are the three big strategies. Um, I mean, the other strategies that I use um, just because of my history is a grant strategy. So yes, of um, course. Yes. So I prioritize individual giving over grants, but I think a lot of organizations that I found have been applying $5,000 year after year. And they're like, but this organization over here is getting six figures. Like, what's the difference? And either they have someone on their board from that foundation or they've done their homework and they've built the relationship. And I think a lot of times it takes one, the courage to ask for more, but you also have to have that solid narrative. So one, a solid budget and also a solid narrative on why this funder should make a transformational gift to your organization. And then it's about building that relationship because someone is on the other side. A person is on the other side, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And it's both about telling, you know, the statistics of your organization, but also weaving in that storytelling and really making that case for your organization um, and identifying the needs and also being transparent. So, you know, if you need something like having that conversation with a donor or a funder or a donor, um, and I've seen this, these conversations play out where they'll actually give more because they're so passionate about what you need and they see that this thing is keeping you from accomplishing your mission. So it's, yeah, I think I there is a place for prospect research. Um, and the best thing that I do for free is look at similar organizations um, and look at their annual reports. So if you, if you're in a youth 
like arts program? Is there a local one to you and who's giving to them? Doesn't necessarily mean the funder is going to give to you, but it kind of gives you that idea of who you can start building relationships with. Obviously, you can look at Foundations 990s. Um, Candid is free. Um, and there's obviously other paid one. But if you're a small shop, I would start there. Um, and then, you know, track. I would track it. Um, there's grant management systems. I've also used Excel spreadsheets where you track the amount, you track the mm -hmm. date, you track any reports that need to go out because reporting is critical. Um, and then any other touch points or interest areas that they have that you might be able to apply for. Um, and then, yeah, those are really the two main ones that I focus on. Obviously, there's events, there's corporate donations, there's other things. Um, but I'm really more strong in the individual and the grant strategy. Yeah. And the one thing that I, I feel there was a thread through everything you said, and it was relationships. And mm -hmm. I think even if we look at events or um, like corporate donors, those are going to still be relationships. So it's being candid, being transparent, asking, letting people know what the needs are, but building that relationship and offering the thank yous and the follow throughs are going to be key. Okay. So let's, now that we've talked about that, let's quickly talk about that emotional component because when we talk about having a board, uh, most organizations have a board, but there are different levels of involvement for boards. So what are those key things to gain board involvement or interest in supporting and fundraising? Yeah. And I'll explain a little bit more about emotion because people, when they think like emotions, they think of like, you have to appeal to your donors, but I do the emotions more internally. So really getting internal clarity um, and emotional connection among your board and your team. And this process, EMC Leadership, was founded by Dr. Lola Gershfeld. And it's based on attachment science. And it says, when we work together, we depend on each other and we build a bond. And emotions are the glue that hold that bond together. Um, and when we become... Conflict is never about content. It's about emotional disconnection. And when we become disconnected from each other, we reach for ineffective coping strategies to reach for that connection. We all want to feel seen. We all want to feel valued. We all want our time on the in the organization to matter. And we want people to affirm that we're doing a good job. But when we become disconnected, we feel isolated. We feel alone. We feel like no one is there for us. And we feel like the work we are doing is for nothing. And that's not a good feeling to have, right? And mm -hmm. boards, you know, people are busy. It's a volunteer organization. And I think the emotional disconnection happens when there isn't proper onboarding and there isn't proper roles and expectations and accountability to board members. Because if there isn't that proper onboarding or set of expectations, they're not going to feel comfortable going out into the the world because they don't know what they're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm here, but no one told me what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to sit back. Some people will take more proactive stance, but I think a lot of times we're like, well, no one told us what to do. So like, I, I don't, I don't know what to do and I don't know who to talk to and that there's no accountability in holding them. And then I think the ED gets frustrated because they're like, well, no one's doing anything. My board's not engaged in fundraising, but there was no or the board chair, but there's no set expectation of when that happens. So people feel alone, they feel isolated in their roles and they are they want to reach for that connection. They wanna feel like they're important to each other and the work that they're doing is important to the mission. So um, I've seen this work in the boardroom and also team dynamics of utilizing this EMC leadership process and understanding the language of emotions and kind of uncovering what's going on underneath and doing it both individually and in a team dynamic where people start to hear that they share the same fears, that they have the same emotions. And it really creates that unity um, for, for those board members to make those strategic decisions because that emotional connection um, disconnection hijacks your prefrontal cortex. So you can't think logically, you can't collaborate. And so when you're able to relax that amygdala, you can move the needle forward in your mission. And so, like I said before, it's it goes beyond just the emotional connection piece and feeling like 
you are important to each other. And again, it comes down to mastering the art of relationships, right? But it is about setting those expectations from the get-go and making sure that people feel supported um, in their role because then they will connect with each other and connect with people outside of the mission in a more meaningful way. I love that you emphasized that onboarding process and setting the expectations up front. And I think with any business, whether you're an entrepreneur and you have clients or a coach and you have clients or you're a nonprofit and you are onboarding volunteers or um, board members or staff, like having that onboarding process that outlines what the... I guess, key characteristics of the organization are what the mission is, but most importantly, what the expectations are of each board member that is coming on the board. Mm -hmm. Do you, so question for you, do most nonprofit boards, do they have fundraising levels attached to board members, meaning the board members responsible for giving or a certain amount of money? So, you know, that was the way that I was trained <laughs> to to um, raise funds, but there has been a shift in the give and get policy. Um, it is giving, what I've seen and from my colleagues have said when I've asked this question is what is meaningful to you? So giving a gift that is most meaningful to you. So not setting that $500 or $5,000 expectation that you have to give or get, especially when you're building more diverse boards and bringing people on that might not have the capacity to give, right? But maybe $100 is really meaningful for them and that makes a difference. And so it's about, again, building those individual relationships and setting expectations based on their capacity. And it's not like a, oh, well, they gave more, you know, kind of thing. It's like, this was really meaningful for you. It meant a lot to us. And we're so thankful that you would give this generosity to our organization, not only through your time, but also through what you were able to give. And so I think it's setting an expectation that way of like, you know, you you already serve on the board. Your time is valuable. Your time is money, essentially. And, mm-hmm. you know, what, again, what is that meaningful gift that you can give? Um, because I've found that if you set that expectation of, oh, you have to give $500, but a donor can get, or a board member can give more, they're just going to give the $500 and they're going to be like, well, I, I gave my money, you know, and it's about, again, about building those relationships was kind of the theme of um, this and asking each individual board member what would be meaningful for them. Mm-hmm. And do you do that upfront? Like, is that part of the onboarding process then? Or is that something you do before they are even invited to be on the board? I would say once they're on the board and it could even be like a pledge. It doesn't necessarily, but I would say it's part of the board expectations I would say you expect, they don't have to be at every event, but you expect them to be at certain events or invite people or whatever, do their due diligence of getting people in the room. Um, And then I would set it as an expectation to give a certain amount and you can have a pledge form. So maybe they can't give it now, but let's say they're going to give two gifts this year and then you track when they're going to give it. And then you reach out to them to ask them if they're going to fulfill their pledge. Mm, I like that. I like the follow-up on top of the onboarding process. I think that's key. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you were to, um, I guess, summarize what makes a nonprofit successful, what would you say? Oh, that's a good question. I have to think about this one. (laughs) I think what makes a successful nonprofit is um, where everyone feels supported in their role. Everyone understands the importance of their role. They understand their role in general. Um, And they feel so supported and connected to each other. They feel like they matter um, so that they can work towards that shared vision together. And so I think when you kind of do that internal piece of connecting internally with each other, um, your mission will thrive. And what are some things that you recommend for that internal connection? So, yeah, that's a great question. So I think taking a moment 
like in agendas before you get into a meeting to just be human. Um, I think, you know, before you get to the outcomes and the, we have to do this or we're behind on this or, you know, like taking a moment, a pause um, to really just like, ha not necessarily icebreaker questions, but like take a minute to like maybe do, I did this in a cohort a few years ago, like peach and pit. Like what is your peach of this week? What's your pit? Um, and, you know, just connecting on a more personal level and I think also, um, you know, let's say there, and I think also like asking questions and getting curious instead of jumping to conclusions or having assumptions is really important. So if someone isn't performing to their best, um, making sure that you pause and you choose, you notice how you're feeling about it and then you choose how you want to proceed. Is it asking questions? Is it inviting a meeting? And, you know, asking those um, introspective questions on what's actually going on behind the scenes. Um, and, yeah, I think it's just, again, prioritizing and understanding your own emotions within yourself um, and cultivating that self-awareness so that you can, sl again, slow down your amygdala, make strategic decisions, be able to communicate clearly, um, and just, again, pausing, choosing, and noticing how you want to proceed forward um, with the emotions that are coming up for you. Okay, so last question. We talked a little bit about the ideal donor in relation to like a soulmate client or an ideal client avatar. So with that, we all have personal brands as individuals. So the executive director of the nonprofit is gonna have their personal brand. We as board members have a personal brand. However, when we talk about a personal brand, we're talking about um, communicating what makes us unique, what makes what differentiates us, and an organization as a whole is unique and mm -hmm. can be differentiated from all other organizations that are out there, nonprofits that are out there. So, I would love for you to just touch on that. Like, how important is it for each board member and volunteer, donor, whatever, when they're talking about an organization, a nonprofit and the work the nonprofit does, how important is it for that message that they're conveying to be on point and succinct and consistent across all sectors of involvement of the nonprofit? Oh, it's so important. And uh, my colleague Jordana um, from Voice for Good is a lot better at talking about this than me, but she um, talks about how internal clarity and messaging builds donor confidence. And so I, I think it's key that every single person has to be talking a consistent message. I remember when I was a director of development, I came into an organization and I was like, what are we doing? And then I would go talk to donors and they would be like, what are you doing? Like, you seem like you're doing five different things. Like, what is the core of your organization? Like, where should I put my time and my money? And so I, I think it's essential to create that donor confidence, to create that donor trust. And it's about equipping those individuals, whether it's volunteers, whether it's your frontline staff, whether it's your board members with that messaging and helping them practice it so that every single person is speaking the same language throughout the whole organization, top down and down up. Like we, it is so important to go out into and have that clarity externally, but that starts with that internal clarity of really narrowing down that messaging and that branding and that why behind your organization so that every single person feels empowered to go tell that story. Mm -hmm. And I think that along with the relationships, that becomes the core of your marketing. So it's relationship mm -hmm. marketing with a clear, concise, effective message. Yep. You got it. All right. So, okay, Haley, how can everybody connect with you, learn more from you, and also learn more about your book that's coming out in the next couple of months? Yeah, great question. So um, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Haley Cooper. I'm in a pink jacket. You can't miss me. Um, connect with me there. I love uh, building relationships on LinkedIn. Um, you can uh, go to my website, www.thesavvyfundraiser.com. Um, you can also check me on the Lead with Heart podcast, which Dr. Robin was on. Um, and my book is coming out um, hopefully October 14th, which is my birthday. So I wanted to celebrate. Oh, it's called So Grow Lead. And it is about what we talked about in the beginning um, of 
the episode on my time in Malawi. And it's both a memoir and a professional development book. Um, the ebook will be going up hopefully in the next two weeks. So I will hopefully share the link with you, um, but you can find it on Amazon, which is really exciting. Awesome. I will put the link to your website and your book in the show notes so that everybody can go and connect with you and you. get to know more about all of your great work that you are doing in the world. So thanks Haley for being here. I truly appreciate it. And that's a wrap friends. A heartfelt thank you for being here. I know there are many other ways that you could spend your time. So I truly appreciate you joining me and be sure and visit the website, therobingraham.com forward slash resources for a plethora of resources to help you grow your business for long-term success.